Hi, I'm Jen Matthew Sadler. And I'm WIM Natasha Regan. Welcome to this video, which is about AlphaZero's handling of doubled pawns. One of the things we found particularly fascinating about studying AlphaZero's games was the fact that AlphaZero was completely self-taught. So it taught itself by playing, starting first of all at random, and then playing lots of games against itself, 44 million games against itself. And over that time, it quickly improved. One thing we were interested about was Alpha Zero's take on different pawn structures, and in particular, whether it would like or dislike doubled pawns. Matthew, how did double pawns arise? Well, double pawns arise um, when um, one side captures or recaptures a pawn or piece, and that brings two pawns of, uh, uh, on his side onto the same file. It's uh, actually it's uh, it's something very peculiar to chess, you could say, because uh, in uh, in games like shogi, you can't get any sort of structures like that. So um, um, I guess the um, uh, the thing about double pawns is that um, well, there are a lot of warnings uh, about that. I mean, they often tell beginners not to do that. Yeah, beginners are told not to get double pawns. Will be very careful of them for a number of reasons. So one is that if your pawns are doubled then they're not going to be protected by the next door pawns. So that they, they can often be isolated and hence weak. And another thing about double pawns is that it's much harder to force through a pass pawn when you've got double pawns, because you can't kind of break through with the help of a neighboring pawn. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, there's a number of situations where, you know, you can have uh, uh, two pawns against four, but uh, if those four are, are two sets of double pawns, then, uh, you know, it can be impossible to create a pass pawn. And uh, yeah, I mean, in, in general, they're, uh, they're a weakness, but sometimes they can be uh, very useful. And uh, well, stay tuned to find out why. Let's see how Alpha Zero uses double pawns. The first thing we'll look at is using double pawns in order to reinforce central control. Yeah, now this was uh, this is something that's really associated with uh, Alexander Alekin. Um, I mean, this idea had been played before, but um, uh, yeah, he really uh, played a number of fine games. Uh, the all-time uh, famous one is his game against Akiba Rubinstein in 1923. Akiba Ru Rubinstein, of course, an extremely strong player as well. One of those strongest player never to have won the World Championship uh, type of players. In this position, we've got a very familiar pawn structure to our viewers, uh, which is a Carlsbad pawn structure. Yeah, it all comes from the Queen's Gambit declined. And um, and here, uh, Alakim played a, a very interesting move, which was this move, Bishop F4. Uh, and at first sight, it looks you know rather ridiculous, actually. Doesn't Black get the opportunity to um, uh, double up White's pawns? And the Bishop pair. And gets the bishop pair as well. I mean, that's absolutely true. Um, but if you have a look at uh, what white has gained with that, white gains uh, real control over the uh, the e5 square. It means that the e6 to e5 break is never going to be able to be played. And if a knight gets onto e5, obviously it's attacking some sensitive points in um, uh, in black's position, the pawn on f7, for example. And, um, well, there's a half-open e-file, and white's got this lever f4 to f5. Um, in order to um, well to to loosen up Black's uh, Black's pawn structure. Now in the game, you know Akiba Rubinstein, very high class player. He uh, decided at this point to mix things up, and not to um, uh, not to keep not to allow um, uh, Alakin to keep a stable structure. But um, um, well, there was uh, a game played a little bit earlier by Alakin actually. So this wasn't the first time he played the idea against um, a somewhat weaker player, although still a strong player in his own right, uh, Sir Stuart Milner Barry. Oh, I've I've played in matches next to Stuart Milner Barry. He used to play. In the Cambridge County matches. Indeed, a, a wonderful, a wonderful old boy. Yeah. I actually went to his house and played some games against him and got beaten in King's Gambits. He was a great attacking player. Uh, here, actually, Alakin beat him in a, in a simul, um, but with a, a very nice uh, attacking game based on this theme. So let's have a look at that one. Um, so you can see that uh, Alakin again retreated his bishop to f4. Uh, Alakin is white, Sir Stuart on the Barry is, uh, is black, and Sir Stuart has played knight h5, attacking the bishop. So I think we can guess what uh, what Alakin did. Castles, no worries. Takes, takes. 
knight f6. Um, probably, yeah, I mean, um, black is playing a little bit less cautiously than um, uh, than Rubinstein did, because uh, having played knight f6 now, the e5 square is free for a white knight. So this is a very sensible development, but um, uh, it's not quite addressing the, the unusual strengths in, uh, in white's position. And, um, well, white's got his pieces beautifully mobilised. Black doesn't dare take that pawn on d4. That would be uh, far too risky. Um, the queen, you can see how all these pieces, you know, rook, bishop and knight and queen, all lining up on these two pawns. Very scary. And when rook d8 comes, f5, that's the lever we were talking about. Um, you've now got one, two, three, four, five pieces, you know, all converging on these um, on this uh, pawn structure that black has and the king behind it. It's um, I mean, it's very, very strong. Um, actually, Bob Vinick did uh, something uh, similar in his own games, uh, but without the double pawns. He just moved his F pawn all the way up to F5. There's uh, a couple of famous games like that. So uh, anyway, so Stuart took, tried to bring the bishop back to play a bit of calmness there from uh, from alakin and uh when sir stuart grabbed the pawn uh, on d4 rather unwisely um alakin went for it completely and um well this is a very unpleasant fork of course uh the um uh the queen Ooh, and Rook. black's major pieces are being attacked here they are it's all rather nasty uh and after takes bishop check king there um, the problem is, is that when this rook takes the uh, uh, the queen, uh, the rook on e1 uh, and the rook on c7 are converging on this bishop as well. So, well, so Stuart avoided taking the bishop so that this wasn't check. But of course, this is still very, very serious. Bishop b3 takes knight d5, rook e8 and rook e5. And uh, well, the game was pretty much over. That uh, that knight on d five is um, is uh, uh, is lost, doomed. doomed. But a very nice game, you know, very powerful uh, um, exhibition of uh, of what Alakin was thinking about when he went for that structure. I mean, really very impressive. Um, so um, um, yeah, so uh, so that was the that was the human uh, uh, practice of that. So um, well, let's have a look what Alpha Zero. Uh, uh, did how Alpha Zero approached this, and uh, there's quite a few examples actually. Alpha Zero does like this uh, this theme, uh, but a couple of really striking ones. Um, in this game, uh, Stockfish is white and Alpha Zero is black. Um, it's from a um, a Karakan. Uh, I think the first two moves were specified by me, uh, possibly even, um, just to see what um, what would happen in those openings. Um, and again, we've got um, actually a, a Carlsbad type pawn structure because uh, Stockfish played uh, uh, e takes d5 against the Karakan. And here Stockfish uh, puts the question to um, the uh, the bishop on, um, uh, on g4. And it would be natural, you know, either to play bishop takes f3 or bishop h5. Um, you know, just trying to get the bishop out of the way. But Alpha Zero plays a, a, a very unusual idea. Play this bishop f5. And after bishop takes f5, e takes f5. And it does really make sense um, uh, because uh, the e file is open, so the rook on the 8 is active. And this queen on f4 is actually quite attacking. And, you know, if, if the knight comes to e4 from black, you're actually generating an awful lot of play here. So um, uh, there's also a, a tactical element uh, to it, which um, Alpha Zero had seen and Stockfish uh, exploited as well. So took the rooks, went g3. The queen had to go back, queen f5, winning that f5 pawn. Um, and after here, queen takes h3. Looks as if black's, you know, really going to get an attack. But um, after queen c7, queen c8, um, alpha zero decided it was better to not to lose the queen side pawns. And this ending is pretty even. Black's got an isolated pawn on d5. But his pieces are very active. Uh, this outpost is available to um, to the knight, and of course, you know, because you've uh, traded a uh, um, um, central pawn for this rook's pawn, you've actually even got the chance of creating a, a past h pawn with uh, eventually with g five, h five, and h four. So this game uh, ended in a draw uh, a number of moves a uh, number of moves later. But that was quite an example. Um, there was an even more shocking example actually. Um, 
where uh, in this position stockfish is white, alpha zero is black, comes from the French, I think. Um, typical isolated queen's, posi queen's pawn position. Um, white's got a nice blockading knight on d4, but blacks make quite a bit of progress. Active rooks, the uh, the white pawn on b2 is tied down. And in fact, you know, there's, there's quite nice squares here. So let's guess, is black going to put something on f5? Ooh, not, not a bad guess. Which one do you think? The bishop. Exactly, the bishop. Because uh, this knight is, is great in actual fact. It's, uh, it's looking at um, the c4 square, the e4 square. But this bishop is defending. So alpha zero played this move. Bishop f5 takes g takes. And OK, pretty bad pawn structure. But um, um, obviously the knight now gets free access to either c4 or e4. And, um, well, um, you know, alpha zero's king came around to f6, protect the f5 pawn so the knight can actually move. Um, it's, it's balanced, you know, it's not uh, a winning thing or anything, but it's a very nice, uh, a very nice, uh, idea. Simply, you know, accept horrific pawns in order to, um, uh, in order to, to, to gain very crucial pieces for your, uh, uh, squares for your pieces. So, I mean, that was, uh, um, a couple of nice examples and there's, there's many more, but these were the most, uh, the most spectacular, you could say. Um, the next theme is uh, double pawns to create a pawn roller. And um, I like this theme, actually, because this was something that um, when I started off playing Queen's Pawn openings with uh, with White, um, I was trying to do all the time. And it's this basic um, idea that um, you play um, in this sort of structure. You play another Carlsbad structure. You play knight e5. And after knight takes e5, you go d takes e5. And you've got uh, a five versus three majority on the king side, and you're just going to move these pawns up f4, f5, g4, g5, etc. And we saw already actually a, a great game um, of alpha zeros with this in the Queen's Indian, um, which we uh, annotated together with King's Crusher in our joint video. So, uh, so that was a, a great game. I'll uh, put up the link so you can uh, can can look at that one. Uh, but there's another. I mean, there's there's quite a few examples. But this was I found this was another great game from uh, from Alpha Zero. Um, and this is from a, a Queen's Gambit declined Carlsbad structure. Um, yeah, Stockfish has played uh, this slightly unusual plan, putting the bishop to e6 early, but not at all uh, not at all stupid. I think it's been um, this type of development has been looked at by a lot of good players uh, uh, nowadays. It's been tried in a number of uh, in a number of uh, situations, and here. Can you guess what Alpha Zero played? I think there's a uh, knight e4. E5, exactly. That's the move. Oop, good lord, sorry. I've uh, gone all the way. Knight e5 is what we uh, is what we want there. Knight takes c5, d takes c5, knight d7, exchange off the bishops with tempo, and then f4. And straight away you see a little inconvenience actually to this unusual development of the bishop on e6. It's um uh well f5 is threatened, winning the piece. So Stockfish continues with knight c5, bishop e2, a5, um, keeping that knight stable, otherwise might, white might play uh, b4. But alpha zero comes up with a very nice plan here. I mean, we've, we've talked a lot in Game Changer and in our videos about long knight manoeuvres. And here alpha zero sees that, uh, you know, it's knight on uh, c3 is not doing a great deal. It's just, you know, biting against granite. Um, uh, against the pawn on d5. So it comes up with uh, a pretty nice idea here. So um, a3, b6, a little bit of caginess here. And now we're going to move. We're, we're moving towards the king side. I think you can see the storm clouds gathering. This uh, rook is going to... Ooh, a little bit of a shimmy there. And uh, the knight comes around to e2. So um, it wasn't doing a great deal on c3. It was actually looking to come either to d4 or g3 and then f5. You know, it's a big square. And of course, since um, uh, black's played b6 next to c6, that protected the knight on c5, but the c6 pawn is a bit sensitive. So a knight coming to d4 might, might well uh, be a little bit awkward for, uh, for black. So a4, g4, here we go. Bishop d7, rook g1. Now, alpha zero shimmied around a bit, but found the planet likes now. G6, knight G3, knight B3, and knight F5. There we are. Very typical uh, sacrifice in, actually in um, uh, in King's Indians normally, or Benoni's, you know, you uh, sacrifice the knight on F5 in order to um, uh, open up a, a G file. Haven't seen it that much, I have to say, in the, uh, in the, uh, the Queen's Gambit declined. 
If black takes that, what well, it's going to end up with could end up with two sets of double pawns. Exactly. I mean, look at these double pawns, how they march through the board like this. E6. Um, now, the key point is that if e ta f takes e6, then uh, rook g6 is really very strong. You know, rook takes h6 is coming in, f6, also rook g1. Uh, even queen c3 check isn't uh, unthinkable. So um, here, actually, uh, Stockfish played bishop e6, f e6, queen e6, bishop g4, queen e3. Queen f5 and um, um, Alpha Zero actually picked up the exchange for um, uh, for its pawns. I, th I think how many pawns is that? Two pawns. Um, it was still quite a tight game in actual fact, but that Black King is pretty weak, and there's plenty of open files. And uh, Alpha Zero got Stockfish in uh, in the end in that uh, in that game. But I thought it was a very a very nice uh, demonstration of you know using double pawns as uh, part of a pawn roller because then, as he said, two sets of double pawns, very very nice indeed. So another um, way that you use double pawns is to um, open up files or diagonals and um, yeah I mean we've seen we had a lot of that in uh, Game Changer yeah yeah I mean we had a, an awful lot of that and uh, but you know there were loads of examples you know it was really a very big alpha zero theme and, and this one was particularly lovely I thought as well it didn't make it to the book but um, but pretty nice <coughs> So it comes from an English um, in a structure and a type of position that both sides uh, um, liked for themselves. Um, Stockfish gives up the bishop pair, but very solid structure with the pawns on uh, on dark squares. Alpha Zero likes the two bishops. Um, and uh, here Alpha Zero decides that it's... Um, <coughs> We've got a number of um, a number of uh, um, factors it's going to take advantage of, but the, the key thing in the end of the day, and you'll see how it all happens, is that this rook on a7 is is kind of misplaced and uh, not coordinating well with the rest of Black's pieces. But well, we're going to have a look how that happens, because uh, well, I certainly wouldn't be able to tell you how it's going to happen from uh, from here. So for zero went b5. Um, that gives away the c5 square, but it does take control of this c6 square. Alpha zero plays this a lot in this type of pawn structure. Bishop g6, um, just a little bit of redevelopment. And here alpha zero plays e4. So blocking out this, um, this light squared bishop, uh, and also making an outpost for its knight on f5. So there's a, um, a typical plan here of playing knight h4 to f5. So um, Stockfish played knight h7, and here Alpha Zero decided, um, it's quite an unusual decision actually, that um, this sacrifice, this um, establishing the knight on f5, was actually worth a pawn, um, and played quite a quite a remarkable pawn sacrifice, I have to say. Knight h4 takes king g2, knight g5, rook h1. So, uh, Always on the attack. Yeah, I mean, it opens a file. Um, it gives away a pawn just to open a file, so the rook, you know, goes into that straight away. Um, and actually, uh, this rook move is actually um, uh, supporting the break f4, uh, because if I played f4 in this position, um, well, there were definitely ideas. Not always clear whether they work straight away, but definitely ideas like knight takes e4, which are you know always uh, quite dangerous. So rook h1 just makes uh, makes life nice and safe. Bishop h7, and actually it's uh, extremely efficient. The bishop makes a move away. You've gained this move rook h1 uh, for yourself. Takes takes. So what has this um, actually achieved? Well, we kind of got a pawn roller, um, a little bit of a. Uh, of a pawn roll on the king side, although we have actually sacrificed a um, uh, a pawn for it. The other thing that we've done is we've opened up the a8 h1 diagonal, like that. And uh, of course, there's a um, a bishop there which was pretty passive up till now. That's um, well going to be able to make you know quite good use of that um, uh, of that uh, diagonal, and it carries on um, because uh, after rook e8, rook e1. Stockfish has seen the idea, but can't prevent it. F4 is coming in. So chasing away the knight from G5, which means this bishop will get access to the diagonal. And uh, um, after bishop F3 takes takes, we've got two sets of double pawns. Well, sorry, we've got a double pawn uh, again on the uh, on the king side, isolated double pawns. But if you look at the squares that they've freed and controlled, so this bishop, this pawn here, defends the, the square on e5, the knight can't get to it. So it makes this bishop on b2 extremely mighty. 
And the pawn on f4 has chased away the knight on h7. Uh, the pawn has moved from e4, opened up the diagonal. And this bishop on f3 is, uh, has got a great diagonal. And do you notice something about that rook on a7? It can't move at all. It's stuck. It's stuck because the bishop on f3 has come. You know, it's just, uh, it's one of those, um, um, well, little side uh, things that... Uh, you can't even play c6 to try and release it because... Exactly. Yeah, alpha zero is clamped down on that square. So in actual fact, what happened, um, uh, you know, very typical, alpha zero tries to exchange off um, the opponent's active pieces and leave them with passive pieces. And um, here, just uh, um, gave away another pawn, no worries at all. Um, bishop can't be taken because of uh, queen takes uh, g7 mate. Queen g4, exchange off the queens, and uh, and there we are, two pawns sacrificed. Um, but look at that powerless rook on a7. Mm. It'll never it's get back into there. the game. It's just stuck there. And uh, I mean, uh, you know, Stockfish, of course, puts up a, um, a you know a heroic resistance. But with this sort of uh, advantage in mobility, you're never going to be able to survive. So uh, you know, another one of those typical alpha zero uh, giving up a pawn for a long term play, pawn on h3, and then gives another one up in order to exchange off the opponent's active pieces, leave him with passive pieces, and then just win. It's, uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I still find these, you know, these games just deeply impressive, you know, despite having seen so many of them. On to our final uh, uh, example. And uh, I think, you know, you can maybe ask yourself a question uh, about double pawns, um, which is, um, you know, why why do you would you want double pawns to um uh to open files i mean after all look at this position couldn't i just play you know g4 to g5 and uh and open up the g file um the point about it is in fact is that um, just think how many moves it takes you to um to open up the g file with g4 to g5 i mean first of all you have to put give it some support then you've got a couple of moves to move the pawn and um you know if he uh, if he takes the pawn, then yeah, he's got two pawns in the way of your file. I mean, it, it takes an awful lot of effort. Whereas if you're willing to accept double pawns, often you can accelerate that and get that in the in a matter of a couple of moves. And this is a very famous example, one that we um, we sort of thought was um, uh, a really key game in explaining Alpha Zero's um, uh, skill and uh, Alpha Zero strategy. And uh, I think we called it Rooks on the Rampage. I think that's what mm. we called it. And uh, um, here Alpha Zero took a, an extremely unusual and, you say, creative decision uh, to open up the G file. And um, uh, that was this incredible move, Bishop F3. And uh, I can tell you the other engines didn't actually spot the idea, which is after Bishop F3, we're going to play. Taking back with the pawn. Taking back with the pawn, that's the one. So, I mean, this pawn actually does a, a nice job, you know, controlling e4. Um, also secures the c6 square for the knight. But the key thing is, is that this open g file is open. And then we get this, again, and something we, we talked about a lot in Game Changer, this typical schematic mm. way of creating an attack. So you've got a file open against the king and you also have a diagonal open against the king. Yeah. And you can bring the knight in close. Exactly. So all those things together. All those things very together. Very powerful attack. Exactly. And um, well, we'll just uh, show the game again. It's analyzed in detail um, in Game Changer. But you just see how Alpha Zero just, uh, it also manages to uh, thinks up this idea of bringing the rook in front of the other pawn structures. It's got two pointing towards that. The amazing thing about it, and that's another thing we talked a lot about in Game Changer, was uh, the evaluation that Stockfish had, which was uh, zero, zero, zero at this point. So it's saying it completely equal. We've got a whole chapter in Game Changer dedicated to, well, explaining, well, first of all, you know, may maybe why why does this valuation happen, but you know what's what's wrong with it as well? Because Alpha Zero has got a huge, a huge, huge uh, evaluation for itself at this stage. Uh, the other nice thing about it, it, it gives up the exchange like that, just because the knight was Black's last remaining active piece. And now, I mean, it's just completely, um, it, it, you know, Black is completely tied down. And, uh, you know, Alpha Zero uh, finished it off uh, beautifully. And, uh, well, you can see the uh, the rest of that game and how it finished off in uh, in Game Changer. Um, but that was, um, you know, our summary of um, of. Alpha zero and double pawns, and actually double pawns in general. I mean, it's very nice to use 
Alpha Zero's games, you know, also to reinforce classic games, you know, classic lessons about double pawns. I think for me, you know, the the, the main thing that I um, sort of took away, you know, just when uh, when thinking about it is, first of all, you know, double pawns, it's always the, the side effects of double pawns that you're interested in, because in general they're weaknesses. But, you know, if you can use double pawns to control a, a, a key square or, or open a file or a diagonal that you need, you know, that would be a reason for accepting that weakness. And I think, you know, like in this game, I'll just move back to that key position. Um, double pawns can be a really great way of accelerating your play, you know, of, um, of opening a file that would otherwise take you five or six moves to, to achieve. And of course, if there's one thing that we've seen with Alpha Zero's games, accelerating its play, you know, that's, that's really what it loves. Anything that it can do to speed up its initiative. So I imagine that's why it, uh, well, it, it, it sort of looks for and finds ideas like this. Anyway, you know, hope you've enjoyed this. We've got a few more um, of these types of videos planned on uh, on sort of Alpha Zero's use of uh, of general middle game strategies. Some very interesting stuff coming up, um, and we've also got a, a few videos on uh, on other great games we've discovered. So um, yeah, keep uh, keep watching. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't yet already.